In this Climate Gen episode, I'm speaking with Eden Project founder Sir Tim Smith about the stories that need to be told to create the future we want to have. Sir Tim sees the now as a moment of great revolution that is emerging from what he calls the New Green Enlightenment. With world leaders of low calibre and backward thinking, it is right to ask from whence will these great game changers emerge? If you have just got your head around exponential climate change, then why not have a go at exponential biosphere healing? With 20th century style aggression erupting in Europe, it'll take a leap of great faith and hope to keep the lantern burning in these dark, dystopian times. Thank you for listening to Climate Gen, where we explore the reality of what to do and how to come to terms with such a severely changing world. You can support this work via https slash patreon slash gencc or by subscribing on any major podcast channel and YouTube. Please also consider sharing any episodes of interest. Okay, so Tim, thank you very much for speaking to me today. With just over 20 years since Eden opened its doors, how has the journey changed you in terms of learning and thinking about where you're going and the evolution of the project? It's a very interesting question that you ask at, at this particular moment in time, because when we went into lockdown in March 2020, I decided that one of the things I was going to do was to draw together all the books that had influenced me in my life to date and reread them to see whether they had a currency. Because the, the thing is, they're a bit like, you know, um, childhood, well, young teenage affairs sometimes. You actually fall passionately in love with the books that uh, then years later, when you come back to it, you go, crikey, was I, how, how was I that influenced by it? Because it, it hits you at the moment. But some others just get you right between the eyes. And one of the books I reread was a book by my hero, Buckminster Fuller, called An Operating Manual to Spaceship Earth. And Bucky, as you know, was a big hero of ours because he had designed the Bucky Balls, the geodesic domes on which Eden itself uh, later came to be built. But also he had been a big fan and friend of another friend of mine called Johnny Allen, who had built Biosphere 2 in Arizona. And I was really interested in how conservative with a small C thinking just kills the very things that make humankind good innovative in the sense of exploring things like when i looked at say the film which came out which you may have seen this year about spaceship earth which is the film that won the sundance festival thing and it's about biosphere 2 and how the building of biosphere 2 started with a great deal of excitement and then the establishment wanted to crush it the next thing that follows is 15 or 20 years of the reputation to the people involved in it being trashed and suddenly people are rediscovering that this was actually really, really groundbreaking stuff. They were doing interdisciplinary studies and into systems. And in fact, they were they were realizing that the, the um, mantra of the modern um, Palo Alto set of fail fast, fail quick. Um, these these guys were doing that and they discovered an immense amount about carbon. Um, and its embodied nature and how it was released through various different actions. And they also understood things like coral will grow back even after it's been virtually destroyed. Now, I say this because one of the issues being an environmentalist, <clears throat> like you are, like I am, is there is a tendency to lie or sit within your own echo chamber and sift through the material that supports that which you believe in which leads to an ever stronger sense of um, either entitlement to your intellectual superiority um, or, or to an aggression towards anybody who has a different view. And I've come to think, having read an operating manual to Spaceship Earth, um, that Eden was making some pretty terrible mistakes. Um, and the mistakes include, for example, we are really successful. We have over a million visitors a year coming to the middle of nowhere and everybody says it's education by visionaries and it's this, it's that, it's the other, it's wonderful. The truth is very, very difficult to stomach, which is that everybody else is so rubbish, we get overrated to be as if we were really good and in fact, we're modestly good. If, for example, the scientific institutions of our world, which we so 
swiftly Lord, were even half as good as all the people in them maintain they are, how would it be possible for our planet to be in the state that it is in? Would our education and our understanding of the natural world not be so good that we would not have allowed many of these things to happen? Of course it would. And I think there is a very, very rapid reappraisal necessary of the whole world of science, the world of scientific research, the way it is funded, what does the national interest mean, and what does it mean to have things like natural capital described as if they were somehow assets that were to be divided up amongst homo sapiens, as opposed to the living systems for the planet we live on. So as you can tell from the tone of my very windy answer to you, I have gone through a real sea change with Eden. I had already got to the point of understanding that Eden was at the center of a system and that systems themselves were really, really interesting. I spent a week on Iceland in the company of a number of smart people, one of whom was Jack Hiddery, who's the creative director of Google DeepMind. And he was saying he reckoned that they had made 19 years of mistakes by being so focused on um, uh, binary algorithms uh, that they had actually neglected the fact that the world that we were living in and embracing the notion of those algorithms was biological. And in fact, biology is everything. And our disrespect for biology and those relationships um, has led to many of the pickles that we are now in. Now, you know that, and I know that. So where does that lead you? Well, another thing that happened was, and something you may have seen, and if you haven't, I insist that straight after this conversation you go and look at, is that the Hadron Collider team, uh, you know, the, 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 the Basel uh, boys and girls, did a photograph this earlier this year, maybe it was November last year, uh, it is the most astonishing photograph I've ever seen ever in my life. And it is a photograph of one single blood cell. And when you look at that blood cell, whether you are religious or not, it doesn't matter. You will feel the spiritual awe of seeing something so complicated, yet so small and so essentially, quintessentially beautiful. And it, the first thing it makes you think, perhaps, uh, if you're me, is a rather ridiculous thing, which is what on earth am I doing feeding such rubbish into a system that's such, so beautiful and so amazingly balanced? The second thing is, if the human system is so intricate and so beautiful and so balanced, and all those things come together, and inside each of those systems that we have in our human body is something called life but you don't see life evidenced in any of the constituent parts of that system. When you start to think like that, you think, crikey, have we made some terrible mistakes intellectually looking at how to get our world into a balanced system as if it was about um, uh, tempering some of our appetites, for example. Let's have less of this, 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 and this, and the, uh, we'll have less carbon, for example. And just forgetting to get back to the major issue, which is we need to have a planet that's a bit cooler. It was, never was carbon. Carbon is a hugely important measuring thing, but because the accountants rule the world, the measuring stick became something that had numbers that you could just go up and down on. And it has actually infantilized us to not look at the planet as a whole operating system. Now, what I'm saying does sound to some ears a little bit sort of hippy dippy, a bit alternative. I think the time now, I think we are actually living at a time of great revolution. I mean, really great revolution. The really weird thing is that the media, who are the, those who would comment on that revolution, are themselves completely ensnared within the establishment which they reach to report on, which means they do not see or talk about, say, the scale of the clean meat revolution going on, say, coming out of California, or yet the fermentation technologies, or yet do they talk about the impact of electric vehicles? Again, whether it's electric or it becomes hydrogen is, is a moot point for you and I in this discussion, but they, they don't take it to the next step. They see it as an act of consumption. Ooh, buy an electric car, that will contribute to lowering carbon. It's like a child talking. It won't necessarily of itself lead to the lowering of carbon for all sorts of reasons we don't need to rehearse here. But the really astonishing thing isn't that it will lower carbon, it is that people will stop looking at cars as if they were uh, their own private property 
uh, and use them in the same way. The way we now use Uber, for example, is a very good a very good example. If you or I could order a car that we would like that does not smell of old fish uh, inside five minutes of going out of your front door, I think compared to using up a huge chunk of your disposable income on something that lies parked for most of the day or the year, uh, you'd probably do that. So what does that mean? Well, so this is a terribly long answer because you said, how, is, how have I changed with Eden? It is my understanding that the that I had never seen the systems that Eden have actually has actually created, and I've come to understand that our starting point, which was a very fortunate one, influenced by an experience I had in Ebu Vale in Wales in 1997, where I met the civil servants who had organised the Ebu Vale Garden Festival, which had not been a success, and I caught them at a moment where they were just brilliantly honest and told me everything they had done and every mistake they had made. And I was aware that we would have made half of the mistakes they made if they hadn't been so generous in sharing their mistakes. But the biggest mistake is one that you make and I make all the time. They said, when we came to Wales, we saw the Wales that was in our imagination and we saw it in front of us. We never looked at Wales. We never asked ourselves. We never properly peeled back the veil across our eyes and looked at what was there. So they, the Wales they saw was a whales of giant coal, giant steel, all the rest of it. But in truth, that had long gone. What was actually there was hundreds of little companies of two men and a dog. And they were not capable of meeting the demands of this huge festival, unless the, the festival had been intelligent enough to plan two years in advance to enable everybody to gear up. So I learned that lesson, and we didn't make that mistake at Eden, but the astonishing thing is, if you do then work with all your suppliers, and we have nearly 2,000 suppliers, but if you work with them, you start to create another type of ecosystem where everybody knows you're depending on them and they depend on you, and you raise your standards collectively. And so we offer contracts which are 18 months long, and if you are waste neutral at the end of 18 months, you'll get another 18-month contract, which means that we're using capitalism, overt capitalism within a social enterprise framework to leverage the good behaviours that you and I would like to see taking place or other place. And this isn't about um, codes of conduct. It's about a web of interrelationships where people agree to behave in a certain way and it gives them all a mutual benefit. So to answer your question, <laughs> um, Eden today is an incredibly different beast to how it was when we built it. When we built it, it was going to be a statement about how humans could take the most derelict of places, create life in it, and then demonstrate that humans were clever little creatures and could do things that were able to give us hope. So we were able to build those biomes, unbelievably light in weight, brilliantly light penetrating, and uh, were able to make the plants that we have fertile. We also said no advertising because I wanted people to come and have a symphonic type experience without being plagued by the modern world. They needed to actually relax. And it shouldn't be like a greatest hit record either. It shouldn't be like one of those tourist destinations where here's another thing, here's another thing. You needed to relax out of one experience into another. You needed the calm, if you like, more languid pastoral sequences before you had, you know, Bohemian Rhapsody hitting you around the gills. Um, and now, Today, we have committed ourselves. Um, you may well know that, that we began drilling uh, for our deep geothermal energy uh, last year. We're now down to 5,370 metres. The temperature is 187 degrees centigrade. By the middle of next year, we will be energy independent. And with our solar arrays, which we're going to be putting up all over our car parking area, we'll be producing so much energy, we'll probably be able to power 34,000 homes. We're digging up our sewage systems uh, to make them go again in a circle because we want to manage the nutrients in the sewage system to grow fish, to grow vegetables. We're in the middle, as I talk, of building a 6,000 square meter research greenhouse. And we were going to raise a lot of money to build it out of uh, glass. It was going to be classic Dutch um, greenhouse structure. But we said to ourselves, what? Let us explore whether we can get a recycled plastic that can give you the light penetration we need. Then, having done that, can we design polytunnels so they don't look like French letters scattered across the landscape, but they actually look beautiful? 
So that's been the challenge, and we have done it. We have found the right type of plastic, recycled plastic. They're already up, actually, at a friend of ours' at nursery. And I want to create a revolution in that agronomic sector because it's all going to be heated by our geothermal energy. We'll be looking at novel crops. We'll be looking at algae, ranging from small algae to seaweeds, um, and also looking at minority crops. When I say minority, what I mean is crops that are not yet have not yet found a market. And we're going to take them to some of our projects. Like We've got a big 10,000-acre rainforest project in Costa Rica and we want to find ways of doing arboriculture within the wild to create livelihoods for people in the nearby town and to do that we partnered with Hotel Chocolat who are going to help us do that so it's a very exciting time to be alive and I think in 20-30 years time we will be looking at this as the start of a new green enlightenment and people often say new movements only take off when everything else is at its, lo- at its weakest Actually, that's not true. The lesson of history would show you that actually at the moment of greatest strength is when new movements take over. And I think the new movement is to replace our observations and our addictions to being consumers and replace them with the concept of us as citizens living within the Weften weave of a very abundant and generous world. Now, okay. that was a heck of an answer, wasn't it? Yeah, I think you've kind of woven through all my questions there. So I'm just going <laughs> to... Go back in a little bit. You mentioned Buckminster Fuller, who through systems thinking and so much more was able to very early on sort of put his finger on what we're coming to experience. Well, we are experiencing now in terms of the, the, the limits of the planet, etc. And you know, more recently, Jim Hansen has, has, well, very recently, he's called it the, the, the big climate short and has pointed out that we're coming into very tricky waters. And you've talked about the evolution and the mistakes you've made and how you've, you've been evolving and rethinking and, and kind of <laughs> being reborn through, the, through this tough period. Is there a, an element of what you've just been saying? And I want to come back to, to all of the geothermal stuff and, and et cetera. The, is Eden becoming... Is it a prototype or is it a refuge or is it, a, you know, you're talking about a new revolution and there is, it does feel like there's a growing appetite for that, the growing appetite amongst people for, for something yeah. that is more valuable, intrinsically valuable. I think it's true. And I think something that hasn't been written about, which I see everywhere and you see it also say in the membership of things like um, uh, Terracotta, you know, the His Royal Highness's, um, uh, st- uh, strategic marketing initiative. Um, 2008 will come to be seen as a year, a hundred years from now, as being seminal in terms of our concept about what the establishment is. I think the betrayal of the wider world by a narrow group of people who were unbelievably greedy and were then addicted to not being seen to be cowards, so kept on going way past the point at which they knew it was reasonable, but they didn't wish to be seen as the first to jump. I think that has created a fracture line straight through what we would call the establishment. I know for a fact that many, many top business people do not actually feel they would like to do other than have a shower after they've been with many bankers. The approach to what was the establishment of banking and finance is now very uh, distant. You're going to do us a a service. Uh, We are no longer going to be speaking to you in terms of your part of our social group. It's really interesting that the only banks which seem to be coming through that are ones which are making a huge leap, a huge leap into um, uh, what was called social corporate responsibility but they themselves see it as being a much bigger thing uh, and they recognise that uh, ESG and CSR are just slogans. They are not actually very effective measurements on the way the world is performing. And it was very interesting. We had a very good period. We had uh, the G7 came to Eden and um, it was it was really interesting how the business people were so frustrated, as opposed to being awed by the big goalies, they were just cross. And they, the sort of thing they were saying is, OK, we've seen all your grandstanding about China, um, but could we just put to you that maybe the grandstanding about China and your 
uh, passionate support for the Uyghurs and Tibet suddenly is to do with actually a deep-seated sense of inadequacy on your part, that the Chinese had a vision for a great belt and road and have invested all their money without going to war with anybody in actually building this. And you, who are about 10 times richer than they are, haven't got a strategy, can't organize yourselves, and you've got Africa and, and, and South America there to be invested in, but with the knowledge that we now have about equity, we could do a really good job, and you've got no vision. And I think this vision deficit is a tremendous opportunity for people like us, especially if we can rid ourselves of the Old Testament desire to wag our fingers at people um, and talk about how you can create um, really positive systems which are self-reinforcing. Yeah, yeah. And this um, actually is, is one of my questions, one of my, what I wanted to bring up was the essential role that is consistently missing is leadership. You've demonstrated sort of thought and the ability to evolve with the Eden Project, which is a form of leadership. How do you see it in this sort of near term? Because we, we ultimately, right now, we have the knowledge and we have capacity, but we don't have any plan, which is what you've just said. How do we, how do we build that now? Because we need, we need a route to the future. We need a pathway. And the Chinese have demonstrated that they can do things. Surely we can too. What's, what do you think is holding us up? Is it these these elites that have let us down and continue to let us down is this sounds awful but i have met very few leaders in either business or politics that have the intellectual breadth to be able to understand their role as leaders as champions of citizenship they see their leadership as being about being decisive they're very old models it's quite interesting paul hawken who i i, I think you know who wrote uh, who brought together quite a lot of the, the current American thinking and wrote Drawdown and, and Regeneration. In his book before that, it called Blessed Unrest, a book of unbelievable tedium. But in the middle of it was a really, really interesting segment. Of, and it goes, I'm paraphrasing, but it's something like there is there are over a million NGOs in the world. And a vast majority of the ones in the Northern Hemisphere are run, are run or led by middle class people. And the vast majority of those in the Southern Hemisphere are blue collar people. Um, and he then went on to say, what the, what the Northern Hemisphere hasn't understood is that great NGOs are like antibodies. They go towards a problem without a particular leader, but they then solve the problem and they're back away. They're like penicillin. And I think our visions of the, the, the leader, the Churchillian thing, they cannot withstand the uh, attention of the media. I tell you what, Nick, if you were to become prime minister, think of all those skeletons that'd be rattling in your cupboard. Not one of us is flawless. None of us are flawless. And even in our absence of flawlessness, we'd be seen as being a humanless so-and-so. You know what I mean? You, you would, you would, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, therefore, I think the models of the future, and funny enough, we're looking at that at Eden because I, I've started a discussion about replacing myself uh, not because I particularly want to go, but because it's a bit negligent to then, you know, die and then no one quite knows how to take it forward. And we're coming to the conclusion that you're looking, we're looking almost at a sort of string quartet of people, because, of course, if we'd known where Eden was today, there's nobody you could appoint to lead it because there's nobody who has all those attributes. So it's an accident that I'm leading it. But in truth, I'm leaning on the shoulders of lots and lots of other people. But because the media is lazy, it's always Tim Smith, the genius, which is, well, it was very flattering. And it's now just irritating. And I think your question about leadership is true. But this, the most important thing is storytelling within all this so that people can actually understand there's another way of doing things. Are you aware of Jamie Arbib? No. Jamie and Tony Sieber uh, have got a company called Rethink X, and they're probably the best futurists in the world. And they've just written an article called The Future of Humanity, which is delicious. You'd really enjoy it. Because it's actually saying that nobody has, has actually put two and two together from all, this, all the technology that's happening and realised where this is going to end up. If you have a situation, I'm living in a place called Lost Withiel here in the middle of Cornwall, right? Um, it is completely possible with um, limitless renewable energy that I could grow whatever I want here in Lost Withiel to eat. We could grow whatever we want around the town. Yeah. Our sponsors at Eden Volvo 
are seriously talking about the fact that possibly within 15 years, there will be no supply chain. It will be done over the web to 3D printing. Any parts you need will be printed where you are. Start to build this picture up and you start to have a world in which you're talking about federalizing our country. Now ask yourself a question, what is central government then doing? What is its role? Are we not going to see uh, just stay with Britain because we happen to be living here. Uh, I would imagine that within 20 years, the mayors of all the major cities uh, and many of the major principalities will have power greater than Boris Johnson does today because they will have access to knowledge. So just think you're a doctor in Blast With You. Yeah, you're a doctor and you have a computer that is benefiting from all of the sampling that's going on. I, I went to Chennai. Uh, to the uh, Aravind Eye Hospital, where they have done millions of eye operations, right? They linked up with the Google DeepMind and the Moorfield Hospital. 36 million eyeballs are now linked to 36 million medical records. And what the boss of Google DeepMind said, he said, it is astonishing when you look at an eyeball and you see a certain vein structure, and I can tell you 100% certainty that that person will have a coronary. And he said, we're living in a world where many things we think are causes are actually symptoms, and many symptoms are actually causes. Now, let's pretend your dad's a doctor in the local town. Just imagine with his or her, or, or her, his or mum, um, are brilliant with people. That's why they became doctors. But the way the world has gone has changed so radically that they can't be certain of their diagnoses. And in fact, many of the diagnoses they will make will be faulty. And in fact, I understand that a very high proportion of diagnoses are actually faulty. So just imagine your mum or dad, who's the doctor in Lost With You, is able to be the doctor, can take a picture of you, can put it through a system, and will get a very fair readout of the biological, the mechanics, if you know, if you like, of what's wrong with you. Then their genius will be how to translate that for the patient, how to make the patient feel good about what's coming and all, all that the rest of it you will be able to have world-class expertise in Lost With You in just about everything you can imagine. So other than going to war with people, please remind me of what central government is going to be doing. So you, you are looking at a sort of natural devolution. Yeah, yeah. And where back power is seeded back, because we see that sort of drain away to the, to the centre. And there hasn't been much reward, it seems, for the, for the people outside. So... Yeah, that's an interesting dynamic. Um, but overall, do you see, um, you know, from from your perspective, as we as we come into what a, what we know now as an accelerating climate situation, an ecological situation, that I'm trying to look at it through the sort of lens of Eden in a way, as being as a sort of refuge. Yeah, we're not a refuge. We're not a refuge. That would be a form of death. It's a bit like you build a, you build something to save rare creatures. You need to save the, the you need to save the, um, uh, the the land of rare creatures. You need to accommodate yourself with rare creatures, not make a refuge. No, I see us as a shop window on a future that still remains ours to make. That's actually how I see it. We've got 17 projects around the world. We've got a project that, that's live in the middle of Dubai, Expo 2021. 25,000 people a day are going through it. We were building a project in China, in Qingdao, uh, which is going to be completed beginning of next year. We've got projects in Australia, in New Zealand, in Chad, in South America, and four in Britain. The time is coming. Everybody's kind of excited about looking at the world in systems, the rhythm. I mean, when you say to people, look, guys, like in Morecambe, where we've got project, you say, just look at that bay. Look at the Lake District behind it. Look at how the mist is rising off those hills. Look at the weather system starting to develop. Look at the tide coming in faster than a horse can gallop. Look at those birds using this, this, this area like Heathrow. All these rhythms and systems, they're all there, and that's what makes life possible. And actually, our madness has been to not realise we're part of it. Yeah, absolutely. OK, so you're kind of, with all these projects, which is, are they satellites or are they completely independent or are they sort of a franchise of thinking? Or 
No, uh, I, I, we don't have a hegemony on good thinking, believe me. You know, I will be sucking your brains out during this <laughs> conversation. Um, no, I, I, I actually think our job is collectively to be sponges, soaking up good ideas, put them in the cauldron, stir them around and see what steam comes out. The Chinese project, we want to be a Chinese project. We don't want it to be a form of faux colonialism. If life is a mystery that is not visible in any of the parts of a human body, and yet when all those parts come together, there is this thing that we can't actually bottle called life. Yeah. I have this suspicion, and this isn't a faux religious thing. I have this suspicion that if we did what we know we should be doing, you know, I know, every single living person that you know knows it is a mistake to be putting chemicals into our water system, plastic into our water system. We know. This isn't left wing or right wing. It's just like we've we've come up with a kind of collectively treasonous inability to lead ourselves out of bad behaviour. We're like teenagers have been allowed to go riot. I believe that if we can clean up the ocean, okay, this is my hippy-dippy bit in the interview. I believe that if we can create a compact to create waste plants all over the world, which stop stuff going into the ocean, make materials that don't go into the ocean and do not decompose properly and so on, I believe that the speed of um, the speed at which the ocean will recover, at which phytoplanktons will explode, will make all our conversations about trees seem childish. Don't get me wrong, I love a good tree, and we have several tree projects, but people who know nothing about science love trees because they can see trees and they know that trees, some know that they photosynthesize, uh, but a lot of people now understand, oh, trees, they like carbon. So they go and tear up the countryside, mess up the carbon cycle in the way they're planting them. They plant the wrong trees. They don't understand they need mycorrhiza, fungal association. So you plant trees everywhere that die. It's all over Africa. You've got Western charities digging in trees without any concern for the people to look after them or the crops that could come from them. And two years later, they're all dead. But the charity that was running it, they got an awful lot of carbon credits and they made money. Is that cynical of me? Uh... Well, I don't know about those individual charities, but if you think about the vast system of, of just the ocean in terms of the role it plays in stabilising the atmosphere. And, I mean, I did an, an interview, I think, at two cops ago in Madrid, and it was literally about the deoxygenation of the ocean and how much of it is turning into a desert. There is still a, a sort of a chance to reverse that, but we're pushing it to the line. And it brings us right back to how important the present moment is in terms of what we do next collectively. The question is, how are we doing that? Because, I, I mean, there, there seems to be lots of willpower again, but very little investment in these projects. And I just read this. I mentioned Hansen earlier, but I just read his paper again last night. And they're asking for a collaboration with China, 1.5 million a year for five years, and that's dollars which to me is, just seems like peanuts. It, Charles you know, Play, Charles what, Play. For what we're talking about. And yet they're, they're making public appeals for donations. So well, the, problem, the problem with educated people is that they're educated in a certain way. I, I was having a conversation with some friends in New York because there's a project to try and build a climate centre on Governor's Island. And we were part of the pitch, we didn't get it. But I could tell that the people were just appalled by me. They were utterly appalled because I said, are you aware how many climate centres there are around the world full of boring scientists who've made no difference to the way the world is run? And you want to do exactly the same thing so that you can have mayoral dinners, you can do all the same thing, and you'll do nothing. I said, what America, what middle America needs is people like you, Nick, people like me, actually telling the story as if there were superheroes. The fact that it's not our background, that's how millions and millions of people go about things. Now, if you're dealing with politics of left wing and right wing, should we just park it? Because immediately you polarise people and you'll have inaction. If you can get people in Ohio and Utah and Mississippi to start believing that it's a heroic battle against plastic in the rivers and against this, that and the other, and we're going to show that we've got the pioneer spirit to do it, that's kind of funky. Why do we have to be so intellectually superior? And then, look, we've been certain we've been right for an awful long time and have achieved sweet Fanny Adam. So maybe a new story is actually worth going for. OK. And in terms of new stories, then, you've talked about 
visiting Iceland, you've talked about the um, the geothermal project and this kind of idea of energy independence. And it sounds like, in a funny way, it's starting to live up to this idea of what an Eden project might act might actually be in a time of crisis. So that in itself is is something that we can tangibly envision. It's a story, and it's something that you could yep. replicate. And I, I mean. I've I spent a lot of well I, I have been spending a bit of time in southern Portugal in Alentejo, which is on the front lines of climate change as it's creeping into Europe from Africa, and the estates there are under severe pressure. But the regenerative farming is actually pushing back and help. You know, there's there's sort of lots yeah. going on, and it's fascinating to see these stories emerging in real time. Some of them are tragic, some of them are, are hopeful, and it is about bringing all these ideas together. And the, the one thing that I found most interesting was how many of these estates, you know, wine, olive oil, etc., are saying that this has turned us from competitors into collaborators because the one thing we have to do is share knowledge. And yeah. now, you know, come back to what you're doing and how do we get the stuff you're learning through your partnerships with China, with Australia, with everyone else, down to those guys, down back up from what they're learning. You know, it's almost like there's something happening and it, it crosses commercial, it crosses agriculture, it crosses our aspirations, which is critical, I think, in storytelling. That's a really good point, Nick. That's a really good point. The guy who hosted me um, in Iceland is a friend of Elon Musk, who I don't know, but he was saying, they are friends, and he was saying how intelligent Musk is um, and I said, yeah, yeah, obviously, you know, it's a bit like saying that Slash is a good guitarist. But actually, he said, no, no. He said the really intelligent thing is that he doesn't patent some of his inventions because he's worked out that the true interests of somebody who's interested in capital is not necessarily owning the patent. It is making sure that the idea you have can be successful. So if you look at the whole of America and you realize that it would take you 10 lifetimes to put electric charging stations in for your vehicles across the whole of America. How cool is it to forego your license fees of $300 million and actually make it all available for free to all your competitors? So everybody makes the same charging station all the way across America so that whatever else you're doing, you've got a consistent system. And this is kind of what you're saying. Um, and I think that is the future in many ways very much the future. My dream for Eden is that, and we've been approached by quite a lot of people who've got a lot of money, and we're very reluctant to take people's money as a gift because we're actually much more interested in getting people committed to doing stuff with their money, using us as a shop window. So by showing how systems work at Eden, we're hoping that a lot of green tech will come to Eden and will work with each other. And I think the coolest thing is if this chain of uh, Edens around the world, or whatever you call them. If the vanity of them being Edens becomes a break, then we'll call it something else. But we've noticed that the less we want to take credit for things, the more people want to work with us. And actually creating Eden as a platform for fellow travellers to showcase what they do and to find new collaborators, I think that's the future. And I think it's coming really, really quickly. I think also you're going to see a revolution in education. I think the old establishment ways of educating people um, are being found to be a busted flush. I mean, look at our own system uh, here in Britain. It is pedestrian and it isn't achieving what most right-thinking Brits would like. I mean, we've got great inequality. And regardless of whether we're successful individuals or not commercially, none of us want to live in a country where the, the degrees of hardship felt at the fringes are as they are. None of us want that. So we've got to do, we've got to come start a discourse which is it depoliticizes chunks. I mean, we've allowed politics to creep into so many things. I what I think would be flipping brilliant would be if the if the or a prime minister could get up and say, you know what, should we take education and health out of the political arena and see whether we can find a national consensus on this? That would just stop all the fanning about. Anyway, I'll finish my rant. Okay, just to end on, when you turn out the lights at Eden in the evening, as, I, as I'm sure you do, how do you envisage the big tomorrow? And we've touched on we've touched on a number of areas here. Is it filled with lots of can do, or is it more sort of oh bloody hell? Gosh, 
my answer is a weird one. Where I live, you hear an awful lot of people say they should do this. They, they, they. They don't realize that they are dead and they died an awful long time ago. So what is happening culturally is we, we aspire to lots of things believing that they will supply them for the taxes that we pay. And yet, Nick, if you and I walked around last with you and added up everything that everybody wanted, it would come to vastly more than what they could find. When you start talking to people about this and you ask, talk to them about they, and you talk about, well, you know that John Kennedy thing about ask not what we can do for the country? I think we're coming to a point like that where we've got to start looking. The country we want cannot be afforded by the country we have. And it's not to do with incompetence. It's to do with the fact that we've got lots of expectations of miracles happening without us actually lifting a finger to make that so. Now, when I turn off the lights at Eden, I have a dream that we will come out of this era of childlike dependence on they to supply what we need and we'll create a really strong sense of community wherever we are and that we disengage the word parochial from the word community there is no reason why it should be parochial but as i look around lost with you i realize there are things that i could do there's things my neighbor could do there's things that their neighbors could do that would make this a vastly better place a vastly better place the capital that is locked up in the labor that we do not give to ourselves, the actual capital that is locked up in our garages and attics and our sheds that could be released for the public good to enable our fellow citizens to build houses on. But we could maybe ask them to make them beautiful so that they were uplifting to us all as we walk past. And it seems that from that, there's a, a huge role for individual agency. And, and I know you were a cop. COP26, and I was there too. And what I really noticed over the last five or six COPs is the agency that was once held in the main arena is kind of being lost and is moving outside to the people outside of the, the blue zone. It's moving out into the communities who are becoming incensed by the lack of progress and are starting to self-organise. And hopefully that feeds into what you're saying about community and about our own sort of drive to the future. Yeah. Well, think, how often have you thought about the following two things? One, every day I walk through this field and I see stones everywhere. Imagine if every day I placed five stones in order and then I walk on. That will take me 20 minutes. But you do it every day. And slowly this house rises out of the field. And it's actually taken no time out of you at all, really. And then suddenly there's the dissatisfaction of seeing that house. And I think that's the kind of imagery we need to get everybody to believe in and it's not just about me or you it's actually even more exciting when it is imagine 20 of us pick up a stone you know you know because it will become that much quicker you can rebuild it you can re you can rebuild and build marvelous futures in no time at all if we remember that the biggest capital of all is the one that isn't really being used it's us well, Tim, it's a, a lovely philosophical place to end. And I look forward to hearing your contribution to the Cambridge Climate Lecture Series as well. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Nice to, nice to see you. And I look forward to our part discussing again. Thanks again for listening. If you are interested to help support this series and help expand the discussion around climate topics, then please do consider backing my channel via Patreon. It will help me produce more content and you will also gain access to more expert interviews. It would be great to engage more with audiences too and understand your views on these topics.